So the recording has started and John, I think you're good to go. Okay, um, welcome to, to the session. Uh, I'm John Irvine from University of St Andrews and I'm one of the, the co-directors of the Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Superchain. So I'll just very briefly tell you a little bit about hydrogen and fuel cells and, and our history. And then I will um, uh, then I will come back to um, to talk a little bit about how hydrogen fits in with the rest of the supergens. So first supergen investments in hydrogen were, were made in 2023. So we're all, almost 20 years here, but unfortunately it's not been even uh, an even playing field. So there's been some hypes and, and ups, and there's been a lot, uh, some downs. So hydrogen has been very much uh, driven by by public uh, perception and, and hype, um, and we would rather provide a follow a realistic and positive course. Um, but now with net zero becoming so so urgent, interest is growing with both governments and industry. And there's an immense interest in hydrogen from all, all sectors. And I guess one issue we have is everybody sees hydrogen as the answer to the problems. Um, we tend to, tend to agree with that, but um, we also see that, that there's a lot to be done to make sure it does solve those problems. Um, also, uh, the efficiency and flexibility of fuel cells is a growing interest, um, particularly in grid support and such things, and the, the technology and the mature products are maturing. Of course, top COP26 is, is on is around the corner and a little bit later uh, the U, or the UK hydrogen strategy is coming very soon as well. And um, you know, there's been it's already been launched in some senses, but um, it, it's building up with, with inputs which you're able to give. So really hydrogen is now coming of age. It's not um, it's taken a while since Jules Verne, but hydrogen is definitely coming. So just to show that, that uh, the different aspects of the hydrogen program in terms of supergens, so initially separated into hydrogen production, storage and fuel cells, then merged and um, it is now ver very much a, a core network and team looking forward to the, the next stages as the government strategy um, um, comes forward. So we're interested in, like all supergens, I guess, is this transformational research. I mean, you don't build the the, the high TRLs, at least in the UK, or um, without having low TRLs to feed in. Um, we need the early stage research search to to build build the technologies going going forward. Um, and in parallel with that, informing net stakeholders and a key role. And perhaps the most important role for superjet, supergen hydrogen fuel cells at the moment is building the academic base and partnerships across the sector. And uh, we have a capability document that was updated um, just recently that, that you can, can find. Uh, this is perhaps the, the most important aspect of the supergens. This is uh, what we do. So we, we cover polymer electrolyte fuel cells and, um, and electrolyzers, uh, hydrogen storage, hydrogen production, which is, is part of the, the electro electrolyzers, um, education and training, hydrogen and fuel cell systems, uh, safety, solid oxide cells, both in fuel cell and electrolysis mode, policy, um, and research synthesis. And these are all things that, that, that my colleagues will introduce in, in the following talks. Um, key people involved are, are Paul Dodds from UCL, uh, Nigel Brandon, who's the director, and Nile Shah from Imperial. Tim Mays is a co-director from, from Bath. Vladimir Molkov uh, from Ulster. Uh, I'm co-director from St Andrews. Uh, Robert Steinberg Wilkins, you, you'll hear from shortly, is University of Birmingham. And Ian Metcalf is, is the other co-director from, from Newcastle. And we've got a very strong, active and emerging industry um, advisory board. 
Um, we've also been successful in sharing out projects across, across the UK with uh, another more than 10 more universities involved in um, short one year projects. And we've got good links to overseas uh, partnering universities. Um, something that you may find particularly useful is the, the Hawaii papers we've produced over the last five or so years on, on low carbon heat, energy security, future energy systems, economic impact for the UK, clean growth and biomass derived hydrogen. So, so these are, are, are all important documents that, that you can look to. Um, the key bit that I'd just like to highlight in, in my presentation is cross-cutting aspects. Uh, the best thing about hydrogen is it is the solution to almost everything. And the biggest problem for us is that um, we don't really have a home because we're, we're supporting so many other technologies. And um, hydrogen has, to, has tended to become a, an item on its own, which probably isn't hydrogen's strength. It's really what hydrogen can do and how it makes things better that, that makes hydrogen so important. So in supporting renewables, both offshore and, and onshore, uh, green hydrogen production and electrolysis, um, bioenergy, using chemicals and, and ammonia, supporting systems and networks, and energy storage. These are all things that, that hydrogen and fuel cells are very much linked to. Um, now, big challenge is producing enough hydrogen at cost, at low enough cost, and, and that that's something that there's been 100, well, 150 megawatt electrolyzers in, in oh, almost 100 years ago in Norway. But it, it's it's a big challenge still, just getting the cost and down and And these were based based on hydro systems where the cost of electricity was, was free. Um, so it's very close. It needs a lot of work and it's a key challenge for us. And what you really need to, to develop something like hydrogen production is all at the same time having a means to use it. You, you can't just uh, develop hydrogen on, on its own uh, without having something to use it for. So one of the greatest challenges is to build uh, production, handling, operation and utilisation all at the same time because all these are, are expensive items. You can't deliver one on its own. So, for example, you, you have you have hydrogen being applied to marine applications, such as, as a hydrogen ferry. Uh, there's quite a number of hydrogen buses around. Uh, these are the Aberdeen buses I show here. Uh, big challenge is hydrogen aviation, but there are some demonstrator plants uh, planes going, uh, and obviously hydrogen airports are very close. And something that, that we're quite active in is hydrogen trains. Uh, and in Scotland, the de declared intention is that everything will be non-diesel within just over 10 years. And the green lines are where it's impossible to electrify. And those really have to be hydrogen fuel cell trains. And that's a, a key deliverable. Um, and finally, it's not just about energy. Um, hydrogen transport is so much cleaner um, or should be so much cleaner than uh, internal combustion engines. So um, atmospheric pollution is just as important health wise in, in the medium term as as um, removing CO2 and uh, preventing global warming. Well, perhaps that's debatable, but it's got to consider both. So where does hydrogen come into this? Um, it doesn't work in isolation. You won't find a hydrogen vehicle that doesn't have a battery in it. So there's very much uh, cooperation between hydrogen fuel cells and, and batteries. Um, there's a certain range and energy distance that, that um, you can cover with with batteries. Uh, at uh, at the, the lower end, you can even go to super clusters. But when you come to mid range transport, it becomes really difficult for, for batteries. So you need to go to hydrogen. And then probably for most difficult applications, like a lot of marine applications for lower long distance and flight over significant distances, you have to go to synthetic fuels. But again, hydrogen has a key role here. So for example, using ammonia as a hydrogen carrier is really, really important and really useful. Um, but we can also look at converting biomass um, uh, or waste 
into methane and CO2 and electrolyzing that to produce fuels or using renewable electricity to drive that um, through fisher trops synthesis. So the key message is that there's a very strong synergy and interdependence of, of these technologies. And integration is key um, uh, you know, for offshore renewables. Um, you can use um, fuel cells to, to maintain operation when the wind's not blowing. Um, you can use fuel cells to maintain the grid when there's gaps in renewables. And, and there's some very elegant te technologies out there at the moment being developed. And in terms of bioenergy, um, this is an example on the developing world of biogas being used in a 100 year old gas engine or being used. Biogas is used in a 100 year old gas engine. If you can replace that with a fuel cell, you've got a very, you can replace that with a fuel cell. Right? It's a matter of implementing that technology. So hopefully that, that that's my, my, my 10 minutes. Um, perhaps a really important slide at the end, which I hope you can see is, is how to contact us. So Marina or, or Sara are our or key contacts, and you can contact any of us um, through through the hub. And myself, so I should be able to stop sharing and come across. And um, uh, We'll have questions at, at the end, uh, mainly, um, uh, although we may have some questions between the, the, the key talks. So I'm very pleased to ask um, Paul Dodds to come up and give the, the, the first presentation. This is on potential roles of hydrogen and fuel cells in a net zero UK economy. So Paul, you can start. So Paul is, is a young professor at UCL and then is a uh, the lead on on the hydrogen um, policy aspects in the hub and, and indeed in very much in the UK. So thank you, Paul. Thank you very much, John. Uh, great to see everybody today. So, so I want to look very briefly at two aspects here, and, and we're going to have, I'm going to do this talk quite briefly so we can get into the technical people afterwards, um, because I'm also speaking in the policy slot tomorrow on blue hydrogen and, and the debate in the news recently. I want to cover two brief areas here. So the first one is about the use of hydrogen in the system and I'm going to skip over half the things I have because I think John's just mentioned them. And the second one is the potential economic benefits of hydrogen and fuel cell technologies to the UK economy uh, going forwards. So I'm very pleased that uh, John mentioned the uh, what's happened with how the hub has developed over time uh, since 2012. And he particularly mentioned the white papers that we've published, and, and we've published a number uh, on various areas of socioeconomics, policy and systems. And if you're interested in any of them, please go to our website and you can download them all without a problem. Uh, we've also had one more general systems focused hydrogen project funded, a, a larger challenge type project called Hive, Hydrogen's Value in the Energy System, which focused on power to gas, but looked at hydrogen systems more generally. And, and, and another notable thing that's happened very recently is the formation of the Hydrogen Advisory Council by the UK government. And members of the hub <clears throat> have got quite prominent roles both on the council and on its working groups. Hydrogen can be used in a number of areas, and, and I wanted to give you a few thoughts on each. So, so one of the biggest areas of interest in recent times has been using hydrogen for heating. But I think there's a number of issues that we need to consider. Uh, first of all, we need to think about the quality of the heat surface, surface because cost isn't necessarily the dominant factor. And I, I say that because most studies that look at heat look at the cost of the technology and the carbon emissions that are saved by using it. But for example, if I'm going to put a new, if I want to replace my a boiler in my house, then I need to think about what sort of space it's going to take in the new technology. Is it going to have a high enough power output? Is it going to be noisy? Is it going to be reliable? So there's all sorts of other factors that we need to take into account. And we need to think about consumer choice as well in that. So, so different people are going to have different things that they want, different values from their heating system, uh, different types of performance. and and they're going to choose their system according to that. Uh, and, and I don't think we take that into account very well at the moment in, in our current 
uh, assessments of how heating might be decarbonized in the future. Uh, a second area I think that's worth thinking about is the politics of hydrogen for heat, which, is, which isn't considered very often. Now, in some ways, it's quite controversial for many people because it's considered the incumbents option. Essentially, the gas industry is coming and saying, please, can we have a lot of money to convert all the gas networks to use hydrogen? We'll go to everybody's house in the country and replace all of their hydrogen appliances for free, so to speak. Um, at least they won't, they won't, people won't pay directly. They'll pay through tax bills or through, through general taxation. And then in the future, everybody will, will use hydrogen that currently uses gas, which is about 85% of the people in the country. And that's, that's considered quite controversial by many people because it's, it's stopping other entrants, new, new entrants from coming into the market by, keep, by blocking it um, you, from, uh, with the incumbents. However, on the other hand, converting the gas networks to deliver hydrogen might be the only way of actually decarbonizing heat for a number of people. Because politically, it's very difficult for a government to switch off the gas networks and tell people you need to buy another heating option. And by the way, it's going to be very, very expensive and it's going to take a lot of space in your house and it might not work as well as the boiler that you currently have and you'll probably hate it. So, but tough. So, that, you know, that's a very difficult sell for a politician. Um, and so there's a need for fair business models that, that kind of that um, balance off these two uh, diversive issues. I think it's quite interesting looking at um, how hydrogen for heat could balance electricity and hydrogen systems. So we've already talked about power to gas and you can also have hybrid devices. So the, they, they might use, have a heat pump that you use most of the time, but you have a top up hydrogen boiler. Or similarly, you, you have a hydrogen micro CHP fuel cell um, and you have a boiler that's attached to that. And when you need peak power, you use the boiler. Or, or if the electricity system is under pressure, then the boiler is used, and otherwise you use electricity because it's more efficient. So, so there's a lot of interest uh, and potential roles for hybrid device, devices, as long as we set up the market so, so they can actually have a fair playing field and, and be used in a way that um, reflects their value to the system. Historically, transport has been the area that hydrogen has had the most interest in for fuel cell vehicles. And there's currently a trend towards battery cars, I think, and fuel cell vehicles for heavy duty vehicles. Um, so, so essentially, we use batteries in everything we can and, and where electrification doesn't seem like it's a realistic option, then we, we start considering hydrogen. Now that, that, could, that could be tipped in a couple of ways. So first of all, we could have a battery breakthrough on the horizon. So for example, if we managed to make a, um, a lithium air battery that was sufficiently good um, with a high enough energy density that you could ch charge uh, rapidly enough, then, then perhaps you, you, you would be able to use battery vehicles and heavy duty batteries in heavy duty vehicles as well. Uh, and that gets to another point, uh, a similar point to last time. So the quality of the service is really important. So you need to have that range. You need to be able to refuel it quickly. You need to be able to do what you want. And, and after that, people don't really care what's inside the box. Um, I think air quality is going to be a key driver for all low, all low emission vehicles in the future. So, so actually, now, now we're getting to the point where they're, they're starting to come into the market on a substantial substantial scale i think we could see a tipping point quite quickly where most of the new many of the new vehicles become low emission vehicles whether it's batteries or fuel cells um, i also worry a little bit about changes in vehicle use and particularly about self-drive vehicles and, and how that might affect the market so for example if, if you if, if you have self-drive vehicles you might be much more likely to use taxis than you are at the moment because they're likely to be much cheaper and in, that, in the, and in that case, um, there will be a move towards cars that are used more often, in which case capital costs become less important um, and fuel costs become more important and the high capital costs uh, vehicles become much more competitive, which and battery, battery cars and fuel cell cars are high capital cost. Now, if you'd asked me a year ago whether battery vehicles had already taken the car market, then I'd have probably said no, I don't think they have. Um, so, so historically, if I look over the last few years, there's been quite a lot of hybrids built. Uh, there's been a smaller number of plug-in hybrids, but there, there was very few batteries until, until 2019, 2020 financial year. And then suddenly in the last couple of years, it's taken off. So last year, 20% of all the vehicles were hydrogen, were battery vehicles. In fact, 
although the number of vehicles sold reduced quite a lot through the pandemic, the number of battery vehicles sold didn't. And, and, and so battery, battery vehicles are really starting to take off now in a way that they never have before in the last couple of years. And on the fuel cell side, it, it is now possible to buy a commercial fuel cell vehicle, but it's refueling is still very hard and there's still very few co uh, companies that sell them. So we're, we're still a few years away from it, from them being part of a mass market, I think. John's talked about a number of emerging markets for hydrogen, uh, and, and we are trying to model some of these. So, for example, when, when we model synthetic fuels for aviation, we, we, we see we see those uh, synthetic routes becoming very important in a net zero system in a, in a way that they never did in an, when we had an 80% target. So the, so the, uh, all, all those types of new technologies are suddenly becoming very competitive, which is really interesting. One of the issues we have is that future demands for hydrogen are highly uncertain. So the, um, in, in some scenarios we ran, we had demands in 2050 varying from two megatons per year to about 19 megatons per year. And in each case, that was across several sectors. Hydrogen is very flexible, but depending on the assumptions you make and the technologies that you use, it, it really can vary very widely. Now, we, we, the most recent white paper we did was on innovation, and we were interested in understanding the strength of the UK hydrogen fuel cell industry, um, the strength of academia, the strength of innovation, and, and to understand the prospects and opportunities going forwards. And so part of part of uh, our work involved doing survey, surveying businesses. So we found 200 UK businesses, almost 200 UK businesses working on hydrogen and fuel cells, um, which were a mix from large to very small, and uh, which were spread across the country. They also worked across the supply chain for hydrogen and fuel cells, from services um, to innovation to end use. We had we had a look at the number of patents that were um, taken that were taken by UK people essentially, and, and and so this graph shows the share of global patents for the UK for hydrogen fuel cells and for other low carbon uh, patents uh, which which aren't in hydrogen fuel cells. And, and what we actually find is that the UK has a higher share of hydrogen fuel cell patents than it does of other ones, which, which suggests it, it punches a little bit more above its weight in hydrogen fuel cells than it does in other areas. But in all areas, the UK was fairly low um, in terms of the, for the number of patents for energy technologies, which just reflects that historically we haven't in, invested a large amount of money into innovation in energy. We looked at we tried we tried to measure how well UK academ academia has kept up with the global community, and we did that in terms of publications. So here you can see a graph of worldwide publications and UK publications in this area. And you can see they track each other very well. Now, now we stopped counting in the middle of, we, we, we finished counting this in the middle of 2018 or so, which is why there's a dip there. Um, but, but more or less, the UK has been on, on track with the rest of the world in this area. We asked businesses about UK strengths and challenges. So what we found was a major challenge is a very small UK market. Um, so, so there's a number of companies that have products ready, particularly on, uh, for fuel cells, but also for hydrogen production. But it's but at the moment they can't sell them in the UK, and, and because of that, two thirds of the companies export their goods or services into the global market, and 60% have joint R&D programs with the EU, and 33% with North America. Most most companies that replied to our survey also worked with UK universities and liked the broad experience and the level, the quality of the research that they produced. Um, but we also had trouble, they also had trouble with access to finance and with a shortage of skilled labour, in, interestingly. And we'll talk a little bit about education later in this session. So to conclude, hydrogen has a number of potential roles, as you've heard. Um, but the level of future demand for hydrogen in each sector and across the whole economy is very uncertain. And, and I think the next step in our systems work is to understand how we can deal with that. Uh, try to reduce the uncertainty, but also think about strategies that account for that uncertainty for when we're building a hydro hydrogen systems. Uh, finally, the UK has innovation strengths across both uh, areas of technologies, but the industrial base is quite small and there's little domestic demand, and that's that means it's quite difficult for the sector at the moment in the absence of much uh, support from government or the or markets. So thank you very much for listening, and I'll hand back to John. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, can, I can I ask everybody? everybody? There's an echo by the one. Can I ask everyone to put, type their questions into the chat so that we can assemble them later on? Um, we had one one question so far, and, and as that's from my external external examiner, should answer that one. And it, it's on elect, electrolyzers, and I'm, I'm very pleased to say that that um, we're waiting on Anthony to present on electrolyzers. So Anthony will, will give a, uh, an update on developments in electrolytic hydrogen generation. So I'm very pleased to welcome Anthony Kucernak, Professor in Chemistry at Imperial College, who I didn't mention earlier on as one of the, the members of the um, of Super, core members of SuperGen. <coughs> Apologies for that, Anthony. Um, so Anthony, please take it away. Thank you. OK, thanks a lot, John. Uh, can you see my slides? Yeah, it's perfect. OK, great. So um, uh, as John mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, developments in electrolytic hydrogen generation. Uh, of course, the UK hydrogen strategy was just published uh, a few weeks back. And of course, you know, part of that strategy is the discussion that, that by 2050, um, it's expected that maybe up to 7.5 to 14 megatons of, of hydrogen is going to be produced and consumed a year within the UK, similar to the uh, to the numbers that, that, that Paul Dodds mentioned, sort of in the middle of the range of the numbers that Paul Dodds mentioned earlier on. And that amount of hydrogen uh, corresponds to between 20 to 35 percent of the total energy. Uh, consumed in the UK, so of course that's this is there's the potential for considerable amounts of hydrogen being being produced and consumed, and even at the moment uh, within that report there's a discussion of the uh, the number of um, production facilities or areas where hydrogen is is potentially being produced or going to be produced throughout the UK in terms of both um, uh, CCUS projects, which are the blue ones, and electrolytic production projects, which are the green ones. Uh, and of course, within that within that uh, strategy, electrolysis is considered one of the, the, the major methods of, of hydrogen production. Uh, and of course, there's a range of different approaches that we can use for electrolysis. We can, for instance, use um, uh, electricity from nuclear reactors to power low temperature electrolyzers. We can use electricity and heat from, from nuclear reactors for high temperature electrolysis. We can use grid electricity, uh, which, which tends to then attract the CO2 emissions associated with, with grid electricity production. Or we can directly uh, integrate electrolyzers with renewable uh, electricity production uh, systems, for instance, um, onshore or offshore, more likely wind farms. Uh, and that's that's what this diagram uh, down at the bottom um, talks about. And I've actually taken some some information from from um, this offshore wind hydrogen solving the interaction channel ch challenge um, uh, report. But first of all, let's let's talk a little bit about the different sorts of electrolyzers. And you've already seen this photo here. Um, one of the first um, water electrolyzers, large scale water electrolyzer systems developed in um, almost 100 years ago in Norway. Uh, that system consumed 135 megawatts of hydroelectric power to produce 65 tonnes a day of, of hydrogen and ran to the 1970s. Um, in principle, there are three different uh, types of electrolyzers that, 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 that um, we consider. In an, in, in the future, in all likelihood, all three of these different sorts of electrolyzers will operate because they actually target different sorts of areas. Uh, this, the, the sort that we talk here, and I, and I should say there's also, um, in terms of increasing technology readiness level, in terms of how long these electrolyzers have been produced and how large they are, um, they're sort of a gradation. Um, the most technologically mature are these liquid um, alkaline electrolyzers that operate fairly close to room temperature. Um, on one side, um, you know, for all of these electrolyzers, we take water and we electrolyze them. On one side, we produce hydrogen. On the other side, we produce oxygen. That oxygen is typically vented to the atmosphere. So, so these, these liquid electrolyte um, electrolyzers of the type mentioned here, 
Um, typically, the largest module for these types are of the order of five megawatts. That means each module or each stack can produce 2.1 tons of hydrogen a day. They uh, have um, time responses of the order of minutes time scales, um, and their turn down abilities, their ability to operate at part load is, is, is moderate. And, and one of the benefits they have is that they're relatively mature technology and they're, they're relatively low cost. The um, polymer electrolyte electrolyzers utilize a hydrogen conducting polymer as the electrolyte. And again, they operate at, at, at similar temperatures, but in these systems, you don't need to use a liquid electrolyte. Instead, it's all uh, the, the electrolyte is a, is, is a polymer. Example of that are the systems produced by ITM Power. Um, typically, the largest module you can get today is of the order of two megawatts. So, so that's, that's, that's the largest single module. And then what you do is you replicate those modules. Two megawatt module produces about 0.9 tonnes per day of hydrogen. Um, and the largest, the largest systems um, with, with multiple number of these modules is of the order of 50 to maybe 100 megawatts. And the benefit of these polymer electrolyte uh, electrolyzers is that they have, um, uh, they're, they're very high intensity, they operate at um, typically higher current density, so they produce um, more amount of, of, of hydrogen per volume. And they've got very good time response. Um, they can go, for instance, from uh, you know, basically idling to full power um, in very much less than 10 seconds. So they've got good, 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 good response. And um, uh, the technology um, with the lowest technology readiness level, but, but potentially with the highest efficiency of the high temperature um, solid oxide electrolyzers, and these utilize a metal oxide ceramic. Um, they operate at much higher temperatures of the order of 800 Celsius or so, utilizing steam. And again, the basic reactions are the same. In terms of the technology readiness, they're, they're much um, earlier. The largest module is about a tenth the size of the polymer electrolyte um, system. Um, and these systems operate much better if you just operate them continuously rather than, 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 than fluctuating the, uh, the, the, the energy input. And the other point to, to, to point out about uh, uh, electrolyzers is one of the benefits you get out of them is that you get isothermal um, hydrogen compression. That is, you can compress the hydrogen um, directly within the electrolyzer, um, and that comes at relatively low uh, uh, power costs. So if we look at the possibility of um, uh, uh, water electrolysis in the future in the, in the UK, and again, I take this from, from um, I take these graphs from this report here, you can see that in 2030, uh, where we've got um, onshore or offshore polymer electrolyte electrolyzers, that um, the majority cost of the hydrogen, which in 2030 is estimated to be about two pounds 20 per kilogram, the majority cost of that hydrogen comes from the cost of the electricity uh, from the wind farm. And when you compare that to hydrogen produced from SMR, um, steam methane reforming or autothermal reforming, um, the hydrogen is, is somewhat more expensive. As you go forward to 2050, not only do you see a decrease in the cost of the electricity, but of course you also see a cost in the a decrease in the cost of the, the electrolyzers themselves, the, the capital cost of the systems, and those those reduced by about, about a factor of two and a half, so that so that then the hydrogen produced um, becomes um, um, similar in cost to that produced from steam methane reforming or water thermal reforming at about uh, one pound sixty per kilogram. Uh, if we look at, at, at where the uh, the decrease in the cost of the stacks come from, you see that 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 today the cost of a stack is is of the order of of around five hundred to six hundred. Um, pounds per kilowatt, and about 50% of the cost of the system uh, comes from the stack, with the, the other 50% coming from things like gas conditioning, um, power electronics, etc. And that uh, over the course of, of, of 30 years, the, uh, the, the cost of those stacks are predicted to, to, to drop by at least a factor of two, and, and potentially they can actually be much more. And, I suppose, and, and the question to then ask is, is what sort of um, research do we need to be doing in order to actually enable uh, all of this to happen? And so uh, typical um, discussions uh, with, with various people in both the industry and academia um, to, to, to highlight the different areas that need to be worked on 
um, sort of focus on, on these sorts of areas. So for instance, for PEM water electrolysis, um, there's discussions about um, testing standards and advanced membrane materials, um, large scale cell systems and, and things like thermal management. For alkaline electrolyzers, membranes are quite important as is hydrogen drying. For solid oxide electrolyzers, reduction in operating temperatures and manufacturing is, is really important. And of course, there's, there's, there's um, a certain amount of cross-cutting issues, such as gas condition, dish conditioning and test protocol harmonization that become um, quite important. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the research that, that, that we've been doing um, within the hub on, on water electrolysis. So when you, when you look at, for instance, the operation of a PEM electrolyzer, one of the important things to try and break down where all of the losses are occurring as you, as you increase the rate of hydrogen production. And especially for PEM electrolyzers, one of the interesting things is actually the amount of, of over potential, the amount of energy required to drive the hydrogen reaction is actually very, very low. In fact, our research has shown that you need as little as one microgram per square centimetre of platinum in order to catalyse that hydrogen reaction in a water electrolyzer. Typically, of course, in real electrolyzers, you have much more than that, but one microgram per square centimetre is actually the, the catalytic requirement of that. Um, rather than, than the hydrogen reaction, it turns out that the oxygen reaction, because of course when you, when you electrolyze water, you not only produce hydrogen, but you also have to produce oxygen at the same time. It's that oxygen reaction that, that where you get your, the majority of your losses. So, and that's because the oxygen reaction is actually uh, quite a difficult, um, a complicated uh, reaction to occur. So it's actually the, the, the co-production of oxygen that you have to perform that actually um, where most of your losses occur. The other major area of losses are so-called ohmic, ohmic losses, and these are due to the resistance of the materials that you use within your electrolyzer. And alkaline electrolyzers are similar in, in, in terms of ohmic losses. Ohmic losses are relatively large, but um, in terms of the losses for the, for the different reactions, it turns out that the oxygen evolution reaction in alkaline is slightly easier than an acid in these PEM electrolyzers but the hydrogen reaction is slightly more difficult. So, 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 so that the, um, the total losses remain of, of, of the same sort of order, but the hydrogen reaction becomes, becomes much slower. So other work we've, we've, we've been doing is trying to, to ascertain what these individual losses are within, within electrolyzers, within these different sorts of electrolyzer systems. And that becomes important because it actually gives us ways of optimizing the system, reducing the requirements for catalysts, and also improving um, their, their operation and their durability. And for instance, examples are sort of understanding different sorts of catalysts and the performance of the catalysts as a function of operating conditions. And in these, with this sort of work, we've been able to follow the performance of catalysts over five orders of magnitude in performance. Um, we've developed new electrodes that, that um, which allow us to thrift or reduce the amount of, of precious metal we utilize in these electrodes. And for the alkaline electrolyzers, we've been looking at development of new catalysts. For instance, these ones are based on tr transition metal phosphides, which, which show higher activity for some of the, the, the fundamental reactions. Also, what's important for the alkaline um, systems is to try and move away from using a liquid electrolyte um, to, 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 to something which is more akin to the polymer electrolyte electrolyzers that I mentioned earlier on. So there's been a lot of work in trying to develop um, polymers which are actually uh, hydroxide ion conductors as opposed to proton conductors. And these are plastics which could then be applied to alkaline electrolyzers and actually produce alkaline electrolyzers operating um, in a similar way to the, to the proton conducting um, polymer electrolyte electrolysis. And this is in, in a much earlier stage. Um, the performance is similar to, to, to what is seen in, in liquid alkaline electrolysis, but still about a factor of five lower than, than, than seen in, in the, uh, the acid containing polymer electrolyte electrolysis. Not to um, leave out solid oxide electrolyzers, um, our, our chair has been doing some work on development of high temperature solid oxide electrolyzers and understanding um, new ways of actually generating 
um, catalysts on the surface of the materials through this, this, this really beautiful exsolvation technique, which allows the growth of catalyst particles on the materials utilized within the solid um, oxide electrolyzer. And here you see the performance. So, so um, in this case, the hydrogen production rate increases as you go from right to left. So this is higher hydrogen production rate. Um, and here you see the really strong effect that temperature has. As you increase temperature, you increase the efficiency. But of course, the desire in these high temperature systems is to try and operate at lower temperature. And the other point to, to, to note about these solid oxide electrolyzers is that one of the benefits they have is that you can run them forwards and backwards. So you can run it um, then as an electrolyzer to generate the hydrogen, but then you can actually reverse the process and actually take that hydrogen and combine it with air to operate it in fuel cell mode. So this then becomes a, a, a what is a reversible fuel cell. So um, just keep an eye on the time. Um, one of the issues we have with water electrolysis, um, as I mentioned beforehand, is that first of all, the, water, the, the oxygen evolution process is very, very sluggish. But the other issue we have is that actually our product doesn't really have very much value. That is that if we look at, at the value of the hydrogen we produce per, per one kilogram of hydrogen, one kilogram of hydrogen or one ton of hydrogen is worth about $2,500. Actually, um, for every tonne of hydrogen we produce, we produce 7.9 tonnes of oxygen, um, and the market value of that oxygen is about $60 a tonne. So that you see the value of the oxygen you produce is actually really quite small compared to that of hydrogen. So you could ask the question, is there something else that we could produce or we could oxidise instead of water to produce something which is, which is more, um, more beneficial? Now, the most trivial case of that is actually where we oxidize hydrogen in our electrolyzer. So that might seem, um, you know, a little bit counterintuitive, but, but in, in this case, we have a system where we take hydrogen and we oxidize it on one side and we evolve the hydrogen on the other side. But the benefit of this approach is that, is that this is an electrochemical hydrogen pump, because what we're doing is we're taking um, an impure stream of hydrogen on this side um, we are then oxidizing it, we're then re-evolving the hydrogen here, and we actually produce a pure stream of hydrogen on this side. And the benefit of this is it allows us to separate the hydrogen from diluents and poisons, uh, and it also allows us the possibility of, of, of doing that and at the same time compressing that hydrogen. And we've done a lot of work uh, at Imperial College and also with a Dutch company called Hyatt um, um, looking at this process. Um, we've also looked at it for recovering hydrogen from dilute streams and also streams which are um, potentially poisoned or have a range of different contaminants in them, for instance, from reformate or, or um, streams that, for instance, contain um, sulfides. I think I'm just about out of time, but I just want to point out that instead of evolving oxygen, um, one of the other things we could think about is evolving something else, some other oxidant, uh, um, during our hydrogen evolution process. And the, and the reason why that might be beneficial is that, is that if you work out the amount of material you produce in this co-electrolysis stream, stream the, uh, the value of your products can be much more than that of hydrogen. And the, the, the exemplar of that is the chloralkali industry. Um, chloralkali industry actually consumes about half a percent of the electricity in the UK. Um, chloralkali electrolyzers look very much like water electrolyzers, in fact, but the value of the hydrogen is only about 7% of the total value stream produced in a chloral um, chloralkali electrolyzer. And in fact, 10 to 15% of the hydrogen produced in the chloralkali industry simply isn't used, it's just flared off. In fact, most of the hydrogen that's used is just, is just burned to, pro to provide process heat. So this is an example where instead of producing oxygen, we can produce some other product, and that product means, because of the value of that product, will significantly reduce the cost of hydrogen. And uh, here are some of the examples that we might want to consider. For instance, the production of hydrogen peroxide, ozone, or persulfate. Um, or the other possibility is the generation of some other oxidant that might allow us to, to, to utilize the 100 million tons a year of lignin that's produced from the paper industry. 
the one thing I haven't really had a chance to talk about is that uh, instead of instead of just producing hydrogen, we could also consider, for instance, taking CO2 and reducing CO2 to, for instance, syngas or, or other potential species. Um, John, back to you. Quite a sharp finish. Thank you, Anthony. So thank you very much. That was excellent. Um, we've had a, a num number of questions. They're, they're still fairly general, so please take the opportunity to, to add some more questions to the chat. And I say we'll, we'll come back at the end and have a have a round table discussion. Um, the questions so far can be answered by by more than one of us, I think. So so Final presenter in this session is Professor Robert Steinberger Wilkins. And Robert's going to present on hydrogen in power sector coupling, developing the next generation of sustainable energy research, is that, I believe. Yeah, Robert, yeah. Yes. <laughs> you're right. It's sort of overlapping. Right. So uh, I'll Thank wrap you. this session up. Yeah, thanks, John. I wrap this section up by talking about two topics really. So one is the sector coupling, which will conveniently take up what uh, Anthony was just talking about, and then have a bit of an outlook of something we are looking into currently, which is more the skill developments for the emerging uh, fuel cell and hydrogen industry. Um, so we'll just see how this works. Right, okay, so I'll kick off with the sector coupling. Um, Paul already mentioned the white paper or the white papers we produced, the five of them. This was uh, published in 2013. There were three we published around that date and uh, rolled out in London. And this one was on the role of fuel cells and hydrogen for energy security in the UK. And I'll be touching on some of the topics we explored there. But initially what I want to point out is this. So we this is a chart of the um, energy use in different sectors in the UK, um, regularly compiled by my colleague Grant Wilson. So I've in in integrated the last data here for 19 and 20, not even sure we have them for 20. But what, what's shown here is the gray curve in the middle is the transport fuels, which obviously you can't get hourly data for or daily data, so it's more agglomerated. And then we have the blue, which is gas, and we have the red, which is electricity. So what we see here is relatively homogeneous development over time of transport fuels and electricity. So you see some slight seasonal variation, not so many people traveling around Christmas, and uh, of course, more energy use, electricity use uh, during the winter time, although again, you see the drop at Christmas. Um, but what you can see here, and if you take the average of gas, it's somewhere in between. So you can see that the sectors, the three sectors of transport, essentially heating, if you like, or process heat and electricity, are more or less balanced with um, sort of unrecognized um, prominence of transport. So I think few people recognize that this is one of the largest uh, contributions to energy demand in the UK. Now, if we wanted to say decarbonize all this by using hydrogen, this would be a huge challenge. Essentially, it's a challenge that can't be met. So the first thing we have to keep in mind is the total energy demand in the UK has to come down, and it has to come down by about 70%, which would then mean we would be around the average of world energy use per capita, which would be fine because this was studies that say this amount of energy use can be sustained in the long term. So essentially be covered by renewable energies. Now, as we know, hydrogen is not an energy source. It has to be produced from other uh, forms of energy. So, and this, as we're talking about zero carbon futures, this will have to be renewable energies. So having this in mind that we can't replace the current energy use by anything renewable or sustainable and have to first invest into reduction of energy demand before we progress into anything else. Then we can have a look at what future energy markets could look like. So currently we have very three very distinct markets, one for heating that is based on natural gas mainly with a little bit of electricity and oil in it. We have the main market for electricity, which is based on natural gas currently practically no coal at all anymore in the UK. 
um, nuclear, of course, and what we call primary electricity, which is the renewable electricity production, which comes into the system as electricity. There's no production, really, no conversion from anything that come, is bought or marketed as primary energy. And then we have the third very distinct market, which is the transport market to a very high degree of something like around 90% based on oil, so crude oil products. Uh, with a little bit of electricity now in, and some natural gas uh, and some biodiesel and whatnot. But traditionally and even up to today, these are the very distinct three markets we have. Now, when we start talking about hydrogen, but not only about hydrogen, I'll introduce that on the next slide, we are suddenly getting a much wider bandwidth of um, sourcing of the energy vector. So it could be produced from electricity, whatever electro electricity it is by electrolysis, as Anthony was uh, explaining, could be produced from natural gas by reforming, could be produced even from coal or crude oil by partial oxidation, can be produced from biomass, uh, so again, including renewables, or just by sunlight and nutrients via bacteria, again, biomass al uh, or algae. So we get a much wider um, set of feedstock from which we can produce the final energy vector. And unfortunately, we are very focused on hydrogen in the UK. Um, other countries are more progressed on this topic. What we should be talking about is not hydrogen, it's decarbonization. And it's not even decarbonization, it's defossil carbonization of the energy system. And we should be talking about hydrogen based fuels. Because what we're missing out if we focus too much on hydrogen as a buzzword, of course, um, and a word you can easily sell to politicians, is we need to talk about not releasing any fossil carbon. So whether we use ammonia or we use methanol or we use methane that's synthesized from uh, green hydrogen, as I'll explain in a moment with this slide, uh, it doesn't really matter because no fossil carbon will be released in the process of converting this, this fuel. So what's shown here is the use of electricity, red, um, to split water as was explained just now, so producing hydrogen, which you could then sell off into the transport market. Plenty of buses uh, going to run around in Birmingham, or they have been in Aberdeen for quite a while and used to be in London. Uh, then run this hydrogen into what you call a Sabatier reactor, it's a meth methanation reactor using carbon dioxide, and then produce what we call synthetic natural gas, so pure methane, which is even higher quality than the natural gas you'll find in the grid. Now, of course, the sticking point is the, um, the source of the carbon dioxide. If that was fossil carbon, of course, you're just using fossil carbon in the process and you're releasing it back to the atmosphere. So this carbon would have to come from biomass. Biomass captures carbon from the atmosphere. So all the carbon produced by processing biomass came from the atmosphere. So it's just going in full circles and we have a a circular carbon economy with the atmosphere as the storage. And if we wanted to liquefy this synthetic natural gas, we get a full substitute for LNG. So what you can see here, we can produce hydrogen as gas as fuel or liquefied or whatever for storage and transport. We can produce a substitute for natural gas. We can produce a substitute for liquefied natural gas. So in this way, essentially with a completely decarbonized set of fuels, we can take over the all the three markets I was showing, and that is shown here now. So the gas grid becomes the linchpin of this whole sort of new approach at energy markets. And we have input from different feedstocks. So it could be biogas, or eventually that is biomass. It could be natural gas in the transition phase of a couple of years, a few years. It could be primary electricity. All this results in the formation of hydrogen or synthetic natural gas which can be produced, uh, transported in the current natural gas grid. If we use the SNG, we don't have to change anything at all. There's zero investment into the infrastructure. And then we use uh, fuel cells or direct, um, direct um, burning of gases, whether it's the SNG or the hydrogen, to produce heat, electricity, or mobility. So we get a system that is very flexible on the use side, Anything that is needed can be done with this set of gases, and we can rely on a, set, a wide set of feedstock. Now, whether we have a mixed gas grid, which I'm not very convinced of because that increased, well, as a physicist, you know, it increased the entropy, or whether we have a 
hydrogen system for passenger transport and trains, and a SNG system which takes over the natural gas grid, including LNG for everything else. Um, that is something to discuss later, but that is something to do, discuss and that shouldn't be disregarded by just talking about um, a very simplified um, perception of hydrogen, what it can do. So in the end, we get a rather complex system, but complex systems are more stable in the long run, more resilient. And we can see on one side the production of hydrogen from electrolysis, but then also the methanation further down. I don't know whether you can see my pointer. Uh, we use all the natural gas grid as it is today, no further investment. And we have a parallel grid for or parallel infrastructure for supply of uh, pure hydrogen for those applications where we actually need pure hydrogen, and that is mainly passenger transport. There's another aspect to this I will briefly touch on, which is resilience of energy systems. So if you have a system that has two aspects, two legs, uh, one electric, one gas. So in this case, if the electricity grade fails, all the lights go off. And if we have a system where we also have fuel cells in buildings that would turn gas into electricity, then we can switch the lights on again. So buildings can idle, uh, island, they can separate from the grid and run their electricity and of course heat supply off their fuel cell, off the gas grid. So you can have single buildings, you can have whole parts of the grid, as you call it, black starting and building up the supply again. So in the um, event of major disasters like we're seeing in the USA currently, or we've seen in many parts of Europe across the last couple of years, where Sometimes the electricity supply went down for weeks on end, so months. Um, a singular um, islanding supply can, of course, even save lives. So I'll move on to my second topic, which is education, training, skills development. We've been running a number of projects, uh, also supported by the hub, so the Supergen H2FC hub, in developing different um, approaches to education. And I'll explain what that is about. So the starting point is work we did about eight years ago in the EU set plan education, and we were requested to set out the demands for education and skill development within the EU, which the UK was still part of in 2013, um, for supporting the emerging fuel cell and hydrogen industry. And what we did is we looked at potential production numbers and from that estimated or tried to estimate what the number of trained workers would be in the year 2020 and 2030. 2020 is past now. So, And in 2030, we came up with a number of about 200,000, of which 100,000 would be workshop um, workers or um, factory floor workers. About 50,000 would be trained technicians, so what we sometimes call, uh, call engineers in England. And uh, 50,000 would be university trained engineers, so people or, or scientists. Uh, this is a huge challenge. Uh, you can't possibly train 200,000 people over the next one, 10 years. Um, that would require thousands of people being trained per year across Europe, including the UK, and um, these courses just don't exist. So you'd have to rely on the main body of these people, about two thirds to be um, trained by um, reskilling, but you'd still need about 100 to 200 university type courses, master's courses across the whole of Europe um, with about 20 students per course to be run across the next 10 years. And this is something we have started in Birmingham. So building on previous projects like the European Summer School, like the No High project I'll come back to later, what we've developed is a master's course that can be delivered in blended, blended uh, delivery mode across Europe by different universities, by supporting local capacity at universities, which would not be sufficient to develop a full course, a full program. Um, so relying on one or two lectures on site, doing all the practical work like lab work and the research projects on site, but being su supplied with teaching material and e-learning material via uh, learning management systems like Canvas, uh, Blackboard, Moodle or whatever. And this has been supported by the joint undertaking, and we've also done some work in this respect supported by the hub. So it becomes a sort of um, mixed delivery of part on-site teaching with a lot of online delivery 
and in that way having access to a full program for a university that would otherwise not have the capacity and in that way being able to build the capacity to train enough people across Europe and just as an insight here's the um, the titles of the different modules so 12 modules in all the students have to absorb we're starting the program or the course in on the 27th of September so in four weeks time or three and a half weeks time from now in Birmingham and uh, going through all the basics of uh, fuel cell and electrochemistry knowledge uh, hydrogen and then moving into the more advanced and specialized topics so in the future there will be more optional uh, modules currently we've just stripped it down to the yeah, necessities to be able to start no high was the predecessor in so far as it was also blended learning uh, offering but this was targeted at technicians so shorter course uh, kind of a simpler level for people actually involved or in the future involved in uh, handling equipment in a workshop so you can see a number so there's a basic module and then a number of more specialized modules and in the end you'd come into the workshop or into a laboratory for one day's training and then take your exam there we're currently developing um, hybrids of this with uh, Northern Ireland, Irish uh, partners and with Australian partners and potentially also others on the continent. And just to mention this, this the summer school that started in 2004, so we're into our 18th year now, um, a very concentrated offering for PhD student level um, education running from next week in uh, close to Athens and having a special uh, module specialized on low temperature fuel cells and electrolysis, high temperature fuel cells, electrolysis and batteries. And in the second week, more specialized things on fuel cell vehicles, hydrogen safety and innovation management and business development. So this, I think, wraps up our um, talks. Over to John again. And I'll just sort of take off my screen. Thank you very much. Okay. So. Any any further questions, please put them into chat. But um, I'll just run through the questions that we have at the moment. Um, so this is I think most of them go, go to the, all, all the panelists. So is there a significant role for stationary fuel cells in the UK and in which markets? What innovation needs to happen to achieve penetration? Just by Japanese fuel cells. There's 500,000 of them in Japan. <laughs> Probably a headache importing them now, but still. Let's combine. But seriously, power. so there, there is several manufacturers in Japan. I'm not sure they market in Europe. They're marketing on the continent through other manufacturers. And the sticking point, of course, is feed in tariffs and any subsidies you'd get for renewable heating, which would then all also be applied to fuel cells. Um, the technology is there. Anthony? Yeah, I suppose, I suppose, you know, uh, there's the, uh, as, as um, Robert mentioned, there's the Panasonic Indy Farm um, in Japan where they have 300,000 um, combined heat and power systems. And the benefit of those systems, and it's important to, to, to point that out, is that you get your very, very high energy efficiency because First of all, you know, you make electricity and then the extra the extra waste heat is then used as 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 you know heating for hot water so that these systems operate at, at close to 200 percent um, LHB efficiency so that you really utilize um, you know all the heat in your fuel much better even than a normal power station. So it's much more akin, I suppose, to having a, a power station with a district heating system. But you have that in your house. And another example is data centers. It's a very important application. Again, there's heat available, a lot of heat available, which you can utilize in, in, in the fuel cells. But the sticking point, I think, is the, 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 the regulatory framework that would allow the subsidies to bring in the technology so that it can ramp up. I mean, they've brought down the prices tremendously by the subsidy system they had in Japan. So similar to the German system that supported Fortsburg tax. If, if you look at solar cells and you see how how widespread they are, that, that's yeah. got to be how, how fuel cells would. Oh, and the, and the other benefit, of course, is the systems allow houses to run independent, grid independent if there's a grid failure. So so the any farm systems will run for 48 hours grid independent. So you've got a small amount of electricity if the grid fails, which which in 
you know, with climate change and, and you know, extreme weather events might become more important in the future. So I move on. Uh, Blanco Sanchez, uh, Paul, Paula Blanco Sanchez asked, when, when looking at the companies that hydrogen applications are very trending for transport, what is the main transport sector targeted here? How does the hydrogen applications in car how do hydrogen applications in cars compete with the relatively well-established electric vehicles? Anthony's already mm -hmm. answered that in the tech chat. Do you want to come back in and then Paul maybe? Yeah, well, I mean, just just basically, I suppose the way to think about it, the way I think about it is that is that petrol-powered vehicles are equivalent, you know, in the future to battery, pure battery electric vehicles, and diesel-powered vehicles are are equivalent to hydrogen fuel cell-powered vehicles, and the demarcation being the distance that you have to travel. And also to a certain extent, the speed at which you might want to refuel them, you know, and I think that demarcation is seems to be what's playing out at the moment. So, for instance, things like trains, as you already mentioned, John, you know, heavy good, 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 good vehicles, you know, you know, seem to be more, you know, you know, fuel cells and hydrogen where you need the greater range and the faster refueling seems to be and also ferries as well. Paul? Yeah, I mean, so, so most most of the companies who are developing vehicles are fairly small, and and in the grand scheme of things, most of the developments on fuel cell cars have been happening at large manufacturers in the Far East, um, Hyundai, uh, uh, Toyota, and such like, uh, and and so it's pretty hard for UK manufacturers to compete with that. Um, at the same time, the major UK automotive manufacturers have been focusing more on batteries than they have on fuel cells. And so the government has taken a much greater interest in having gigafactories of batteries than it has in fuel, fuel cell manufacturing. And, and I think between those two things, it, it means that there hasn't been much focus at all on fuel cell cars in the UK. When we start looking at heavier vehicles, though, they're much more specialist and they tend to be made on much smaller scales. And, and they're an area in which companies, smaller companies can take a much greater role in. So, so there's a big question about and, and, uh, engineering integration uh, and we've seen that with buses um, so, so there's a couple of UK bus companies that have been developing the uh, fuel cell versions of their buses to sell in the UK and and most most of the heavier duty vehicles tend tend to be sourced more locally than the light duty vehicles uh, and I, th I think aside from the fact that ha fuel cells are more suited to heavy or, 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 or at least batteries are not well suited to heavy duty vehicles at the moment and current lithium ion technology probably never will be um, so that that's a, that's a big push for having fuel cells there but the other big push is that it's more ex the more accessible market for the for uk manufacturers than the car market would be i think fuel cells may fo may follow batteries in the, in, the, in the car market, but think of something like a, a bin lorry or a refuge collection vehicle. You know, it's sitting stationary, ch um, crushing rubbish, belting out fumes from diesel. So there's a very different mode of operation, which is much more suited to electric. And you won't, I don't think you'll drive a bin lorry with, with batteries. So, so that you might call them niche app applications, but, but they're very real applications. Um, John Barton says the cost of electrolysis using elect renewable electricity is dominated by the cost of electricity. But what assumed utilization factor and what cost per kilowatt hour of, of wind or solar power? Yeah, I posted the response. You posted the response already. So, um, yeah, 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 which, which just sort of points to the offshore. But of course, you know, it. it it's true, it is highly variable and it depends where your electricity has come from. Maybe maybe Paul would be a better person to speak about this because you've probably got, you know, you know, you know, uh, good understanding of this area. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, a good, it's a good question. So if you're using offshore wind, you can probably get up to 45, 50% capacity factor. Well, that's the general capacity factor of offshore wind. Um, so, so there is an opportunity there. Now, now that offshore wind, um, based based on strike prices that have been agreed, offshore wind is cheaper than wholesale electricity. So there's actually an option there for people if if they have the means to put it in place to 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 have a direct connection from off, offshore wind to electrolyzers, uh, to cut out the grid and to make uh, and to use electricity that's cheaper than grid electricity would be, or if they do use the grid to maybe top up at other times. Uh, and, and that's something companies are starting to look at in the UK. So, for example, on industrial sites that that might require hydrogen in future in industrial clusters, 
to have a direct of offshore wind uh, link to, the, to those sites, providing both electricity and providing um, for the sites, but also providing electricity to electrolyzers to produce hydrogen uh, where that's needed. And I suppose that's that that was the finding with the electrolyzers that I put up, you know, and, and also John, you know, those ones in Norway where you had a stranded electric, you had a stranded hydroelectric, you know, dam, and they were using that that hydroelectricity to generate hydrogen locally and then convert that to ammonia and export it. This well the bulb is more as more applications come out and more more renewables come on stream. You can only produce so much renewable electricity. So you need to use it for something else. A couple of questions about the hydrogen strategy um, um, from Laura Bra Bravo Diaz and Tim Mays, our co esteemed colleague, th threw in a, a question as well. As well. Um, so how do we consider that the strategy was launched last month in comparison to the EU one in 2020? What are the other main differences? All of you probably look most closely. I think in the UK strategy, there was certainly a lot of questions to be resolved and, and inputs requested. I think that's one practical difference. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's important we have a strategy, so that's <laughs> the first thing to say. Uh, it's been quite a long time coming. Um, it's, in, it's interesting there's been a big focus on blue hydrogen versus green hydrogen as part of that. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's an important question. Um, and the fact that the strategy came out just about the same time as a, a somewhat controversial paper from the States that got a lot of attention that basically said blue hydrogen is worse than burning coal. As a, maybe unfortunate timing, but I mean, I think there's very good that there's very good reasons why you can say that that paper is not realistic in terms of what we'd be doing in the UK if we did use youth blue hydrogen in the UK. Yeah. Um, but I don't, so, don't think we, I don't think we can sell blue hydrogen. I've heard from Europe, but they won't buy hydrogen from the UK if, if there's blue hydrogen in the mix. So you, your export market disappears, which in Scotland is a major thing. Yeah, no, so, I mean, it's, it's interesting. So I wonder how you do. There, there was also a consultation on a green hydrogen standard uh, and a paper put out on on, on um, life cycle emissions for hydrogen, which, which cover the upstream emissions that you would have for blue hydrogen, which are the big issue here. Uh, and part part of Part of uh, setting up a standard is, decide, is deciding how you actually count hydrogen. So, for example, if I look at renewable electricity, I, I, I can't separate the electrons coming out of my uh, plug from uh, or going through my plug from uh, renewables or non-renewables. And, and you have a similar problem, similar challenge with hydrogen. You know, hydrogen is hydrogen uh, once it gets into a distribution system. And so actually say, saying we won't take blue hydrogen, does that mean that they won't take any hydrogen if there's some blue if blue hydrogen was used to produce part of it? Or, or does that mean that we produce certificates for green hydrogen? And as long as long as we have enough certificates to show what we exported is green, that's OK. I, I don't know. So, so that there'll be a, it, it, it turns into a complex accounting issue and and and, and uh, having a lot of discussions on governance. But the main well, probably is also, that is already done in the green electricity markets. It's essentially all there already. Probably also the major difference between the two two strategies is the European strategy only talks about 13 to 14 percent of European energy being hydrogen, whereas the UK strategy seems to be much larger at maybe 20 to 35 percent hydrogen. Uh, you know, along with the fact that the European strategy is is all green hydrogen, whereas the UK includes blue. Um, I don't know how much longer we've got left, but going to the, um, is there any influence of Brexit on education, Robert? Yes. Is that going to harm our ability to produce new courses? Because there's been a lot uh, in, from Europe. In, in some way, yes, because we're cutting off all the continental European students. I mean, there's no point of anybody coming from from France to study in in the UK anymore. You pay 24 grand for a year. Uh, which you used to have the the home home student uh, rate, which was much less. So either nine for undergraduates or, or four and four and something for the PhD students, and those students aren't are just have have just left. And the question is, as more English speaking courses are built and programs are built across the continent, uh, that will 
grab a lot of the international students we currently have. Although the, the one thing to say is the UK system is not quite aware of what the strength is. And the strength is we have 12 month MSc programs. So instead of having two years where you pay 10, 10,000 euros per year, you pay uh, 24 pounds for one year, you finished faster. Of course, the quality is not exactly the same. Uh, so the quality of the research projects is really bad. But uh, nevertheless, these students come back as good PhD students. So we are losing the EU students. Yeah, we are. Uh, and add to that the Erasmus uh, uh, scandal. And, and of course, so it's, it's hard to say. It's not really having an impact on the educational system, but it's having an impact of the mix of students we have. I'll try to squeeze at least one more question in, and then I'll, I'll probably get shut down soon. So uh, Patricia asks, in the bioenergy hub session, two topics came up. One is the viability of separating hydrogen from biogas. And uh, one is the, the sensitivity of, of applications other than fuel cells to, to impurities in, in the hydrogen. Yeah. I mean, Rob Roberts already suggested, promoted the idea of, of, a, of a composite gas network, which would go with not even separating the hydrogen from the, from the, from the biogas in, in the first place. If you're stationary fuel cells, which are high temperature fuel cells, you don't even care about what the composition of the gas is. The value would be if you wanted to use it for transport and you needed very high purity hydrogen, that's where the separation becomes really, really critical. And Anthony partly covered that already. But I don't even accept that because for long range transport like maritime air, uh, long haul road, I would uh, I would go for LN LSNG and high temperature fuel cells. There's no need for very pure hydrogen. It's essentially for passenger transport, portable and rail. But in the next five years, it won't, it's, it's going to be hydrogen. I would say. Yeah, but it won't be much more than these sectors and industry, of course, where the, the, um, the impurities don't matter too much if you're just using it for heat. Or reduction in, in steel industry. Okay. Um, okay. Do, Do we, we see... have to close now? <laughs> I'm waiting for that question. <laughs> Quite happy to carry on. Let's see when somebody stops us. Um, Do the panel see the emerging green green production being developed around centralized electrolyzers, or is it more realistic to have smaller production sites close to renewable generation sites? Anthony. You're... Well, I suppose I suppose one of the benefits with with electrolyzer technology is it scales at 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 um, high efficiency to relatively small sizes. So, provided you're at the uh, the module size, you know, for instance, uh, you know, one or two megawatts, you achieve the same efficiency. You know, in the in the, in the benefits and going to very very large farms are, um, you know, there are some further benefits, but but you you know you know you maintain high efficiency at relatively small scale. So that's, I suppose, one of the benefits with electrolyzer technology is that is that even at relatively small scale, you achieve still, still the same high efficiency. Um, so you can actually do both, really. It's not so easy to move hydrogen around the country as well at present. But if you produce ammonia in large scale, for example, or, or SNG, is, um, you can do that. Paul? Yeah, I, mean, I, I could see small electrolyzers having a big role at refueling stations. So particularly, particularly at the start of a transition towards hydrogen, if we were using hydrogen on a relatively large scale for transport, that then if you're starting to put blue hydrogen in, into any sort of pipeline network, it becomes, it, 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 it's quite expensive to get it to the sort of quality that you need for um, refueling stations for vehicles. Uh, and so, in in that case, perhaps we would produce the hydrogen separately for refueling for refueling applications. May just, Maybe, offer, yeah, yeah. May just offer another view. You essentially you have to decide: is it easier and cheaper to use the electricity network for transport of energy or the gas network? And do you have a potent uh, a means of transport for the hydrogen? That that is the sticking point. And what and and the other one is regulatory. Um, Regulation. So, for instance, if you in Germany try to have a local uh, electrolyzer at fueling station, you'll pay so much for grid use that it totally destroys your business case, that it utterly destroys it. 
So either you have direct access to the wind farm and you can get the electricity at three and a half pence or something per kilowatt hour, or it just doesn't fly because you have to pay for the grid grid usage. Yeah, also I think grid, um, grid isolated hydrogen production may attract better subsidies. Right. There is a and, discussion yeah. is that might, that might be much preferable and that'll yeah. make a huge difference. And Dan's grid usage fees, of, yeah. no, grid so usage fees of course, is regulation. That's the point. Sorry. <laughs> the last question, Kwang Dao, is a very nice question. It's how do we address intermittency? And that's exactly what the likes of Anthony and Robert and I want to do in the coming years. And I'm sure Paul wants to help us get the policy that. So thank you very much. And I think I'm sure Daniel wants me to stop now. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I, as much as I've really enjoyed the discussion, um, and I think this has been a really interesting session, we must stop because our next session starts at half past 12, so we must allow people some break. Um, so thank you very much, John, for leading that session. And thank you to all of you for presenting and speaking. Thank you very much for having us. Thanks a lot. And thank you. See you later. Thank you. Bye. Bye.